Welcome to church. Welcome to Equipus Budapest. Uh, Budapest is one of the uh, brightest, most beautiful cities in Europe. Uh, it is such an honor and such a privilege to be able to speak to you today. Uh, I, I find this series uh, incredibly rich and so meaningful, especially in the context of what we are going through in 2020 and 2021. You know, most of the world is so desperate and uh, depressed because of what's happening in the world. And of course, we do not neglect uh, what's happening, but we realize that God is somehow um, above all of this and He is going to turn this into a blessing. You know, the Bible says that all things work together for the benefit of those who love Him. And uh, so I have good news. God is still in control. And not only that, but we as His children, uh, we have the greatest privilege. We have full access uh, to the Father, full access to Him. Um, two weeks ago, I was sharing a message called Full Access to the Throne. And I was sharing on the um, amazing privilege that we can come to the throne to help, uh, to find help in the time of need. And we all need uh, to find help in this time. We need to find grace, find a miracle, find a breakthrough in this special time. So that's uh, the first one, full access to the throne. Then last week I was sharing on full access to the table. And I was, uh, you know, encouraging us to persist, just like the Canaanite woman, the Syrophoenician woman persisted until she got her miracle. Maybe you just need to push a little bit more by faith and in perseverance, not giving up. We have full access to the table. And I want to take it just a bit further today. And the title of my message today is Full Access to the Kingdom. And I want to show you how, you know, God destined us for the kingdom. We are not orphans. We're children. We are not just some kind, some kind of slaves. We are invited. We've been invited to the kingdom. You know, that was Jesus' introductory message. He said, hey, the kingdom of heaven is near. He has introduced us to the kingdom of God. Uh, what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to just share a story from the Old Testament that speaks so powerfully uh, about this and illustrates uh, in an amazing way what I want to share. And then I'm just going to give you a couple of scriptures from the New Testament and then we'll pray. Is that a deal? Uh, here we go. It's a story about a young man from the Old Testament that we, you, can, you can find, you can read it later in 2 Samuel chapters 4 and 9. 2 Samuel chapters 4 and 9. And the story of this man is um, incredibly uh, touching and emotional and powerful. Um, the name of this young gentleman is Mephibosheth. You may, have, you may have heard his name or his story, but uh, I'm sure that many Christians have never really touched on this story. Um, you know, it starts incredibly sadly. It, it starts um, when Mephibosheth is five years old. And in one day he loses both his father, Jonathan, as well as his grandfather, King Saul. They both die in the battle. And Mephibosheth is the little guy, five years old. He loses his father, who was an heir to the throne, and he loses his grandpa, King Saul, the first king ever, the first king of Israel ever. They both died in battle. That's another story for another message. But with losing uh, his father and his grandfather, he also lost his sonship and his royalty. 
He is no more a son. He is no more a future king. All of the sudden, everything changes for him. He literally lost his future. He literally lost his destiny, his call. And what's even more heartbreaking is that he also lost his own security with the loss of his father. There is something deep within us that is defined by our fathers. And Mephibosheth loses everything from underneath his feet when his father dies, Jonathan, and his grandfather, King Saul, both of them in one day. And the story continues. For the fear of revenge of the new king, his babysitter takes him to a place of hiding. Of course, historically, often the new kings would kill the family of the previous king so they would not present a threat to their own uh, royal status and their own throne. The new king is David, and of course, we will see that David had a different heart. But Mephibosheth's babysitter didn't know that. And so she takes him away to safety. And as she does that, an accident happens. And Mephibosheth falls and he becomes a crippled person, a, a cripple for the rest of his life. He becomes handicapped for the rest of his life. And uh, tragedy happens on tragedy. Since his father is not there to define his identity, someone else does. And the little boy becomes known as Mephibosheth. Now, for those of us that do not really speak Hebrew, Mephibosheth is a very bad name. It literally means from the mouth of shame. It could be translated as the one who was spit out because of shame. Uh, it was a pretty bad name that this little boy is given. Before his original, original name was Meribal, which means loved by Baal. And now his name uh, represents his stigma, his status, everything he lost. And he is given that definition over his life that basically declares a complete destiny full of shame and misfortune on him. Spit out with shame from the mouth of shame, Mephibosheth. And from there on, he lives with a shameful identity. Uh, because of his handicaps, he only has some little limited movements. And he is put in a hiding far from the palace, far from the place where he grew up, the place that represented his future and his destiny. He is left without an inheritance. And for a full generation span, possibly for 25 years or so, he lives in hiding, raising a son himself. So in the course of time, Mephibosheth, far away from the palace, Far away from the place of his dreams, he is in hiding and he spends his life and a generation later passes. The, uh, time passes and a generation later, he is there raising a son himself. Now, friends, this breaks my heart. This little boy grows up without a father, without a grandfather. His his dreams, his destiny, all of that taken away from him. Not only that, but he gets crippled. 
he has to go into hiding and his name is changed into a shameful declaration on his future from the mouth of shame. Uh, you know, I wonder at which point he truly, he truly realized what he lost. Maybe as he was growing up as a teenager, he would start asking all those questions. Who am I? Why has this happened to me? What is really my identity? Where do I come from? Why are we hiding? And he would discover all of the answers to these questions. And he would stay in hiding. Now, when we go into chapter 9 of 2 Samuel, David, the new king, he comes to a point in his kingship where he wants to show grace to the family of the previous king. And he starts searching for anybody who would be still alive from the line of the previous king, Saul. Now we of course know that Saul wanted to kill David. So this is a great gesture of grace. David, the new king, wants to show grace to the family of Saul, the previous king. So there is a cry uh, from King David, the new king, that says, is there anyone left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness? This is what we read in chapter 9 of 2 Samuel. Is there anyone left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness? And of course, Long story short, Mephibosheth is found. I can imagine the day when he was summoned by King David. Maybe first he was in trembling. He was not sure what's going to happen. Maybe he thought, well, this is my death sentence. But he's summoned into the palace. And David is there showing him uh this amazing favor and grace. He invites him to be a part of his family, to be a part of his life. A new father figure, David. A new king steps into his life. This is so amazing. While his own father, Jonathan, and his grandfather, King Saul, are lost, now his kingship is restored. His inheritance was also restored. All that was lost was going to be returned to him. And not only that, but he would share uh, the place at the king's table. He would, he would have breakfast with the king every day. Which means... His royalty was restored. He was born for royalty. He lost it. And now it was given back to him. He was, he was about to share at the king's table. And also his identity was reestablished. You know, when he first came to King David and he heard the great news, you know how he responded. This is what he said. Why, David? Why, king? Should he notice a dead dog like me? He would consider himself just a dead dog. Not much. But friends, having breakfast with the king every morning will heal that. And his identity is fully restored. God wants to do that with anybody. And how great that Mephibosheth, everything he lost... Everything that was taken away from him is now being restored in his life. His inheritance, his future, his identity. And if you want to read the rest of the story in chapter 16, basically his proclamation is, even if they take anything from me, I just want to be at the king's table. Friends, 
I love this story because it shows me in, in such a powerful and graphic way what God has done with us. You know, we have lost full access to the table, full access to the throne, full access to the kingdom. Because of our own sin, we have lost what rightfully belonged to us. It was taken away. We were robbed of that. You know, the Bible says that Satan is a thief. He is a robber. He is the one who wants to take that away. And, and he was pretty successful in that. But with Jesus, we have that full access to the throne, the full access to the table, and full access to the kingdom restored. Let me just give you a couple of verses from the New Testament. The first one is in Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Jesus uh, uh, says this, uh, these powerful uh, words to his disciples. He says, fear not, you little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I love this statement. You know, they were just a little flock, just a small band of brothers. But Jesus says, hey, don't you underestimate uh, the power of your calling. Because the Father is, is looking at you, maybe just a little flock right now. But He sees you as kings. He sees you as royalty. He has given you the kingdom. He has the pleasure in giving you his kingdom. Now, some of you need to hear that because hear that because you're living with this complex, with this inferiority complex, with this um, feeling of rejection and and depression. But hey, I want to I want to remind you of who you are. You've been given full access back to the kingdom. Jesus says to you as well, hey, cheer up. Fear not, the Father takes pleasure in giving you the kingdom. The second scripture is in Galatians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Paul says, and because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. Um, and if a son, then an heir through God. Wow. In other words, you are not a slave, you are a son. If you are a son, you are an heir. We are so blessed. You know, God literally adopted us into his kingdom. He has invited us to sit at his table. You became a son. And if you're a son of the king, that means you share uh, the inheritance with your father, the king. This is so powerful. What is your inheritance? Everything that Jesus paid for on the cross is a part of your inheritance. Everything that over generations and over centuries was restored to the church that's your inheritance. Everything God prepared for you and promised you in the scripture, that's your inheritance. You are co-heirs. I am a co-heir with God, not a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. I love this. Another powerful uh, verse in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Friends, you are a part of the royal priesthood. In other words, you've been invited to minister to the king. You have access to the kingdom, to minister to God. You know, we don't do that as slaves. We don't do that as beggars. We come into his presence as royal priesthood. We share the kingdom 
with him. We are doing ministry in the royal court. That is who we are. That is part of our identity. And finally, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Friends, I just pray that you let that sink deep inside of you. You know, the reason Jesus suffered, the reason Jesus became like one of us, he became poor, uh, he went to the cross, is so that by his poverty, by his stripes, by his sacrifice, we may get blessed. He left the throne so we could have an access to the throne. He left the kingdom of heaven so we could have the access to the kingdom. This is the best news ever. I hope that does something with you, friend. We have full access. Now, some of you have been living in misery for too long. Some of you have been living in self-pity for too long. Some of you have been living in poverty mentality for too long. Friends, in the name of Jesus, I break that. I break that in your life. I break that in your mindset. You don't have to live like that a second later. You've been given full access to the kingdom. Well, you know, just like Mephibosheth, you may be carrying stigmas, labels, nicknames, declarations over your own life. Maybe your name is not Mephibosheth. Maybe you have another thing you're saying in your own head that's bringing shame over your life. Maybe you're living in regret. Things in your past bring shame in your memories. There is a day, this is a day of new beginnings for you, friend. Now, the, the first thing you have to do for those of you that you have, for those of you that have not received Christ into your own life as your personal Lord and Savior, the first thing you have to do is give your life to Him. Ask Him to cleanse you of your sin and to receive you as a son or a daughter. He will do that. He paid for your sins already. And once you do that, you have to constantly remind, you, remind yourself of who you are. And let Him, His truth, His revelation transform your thinking. Don't stay in hiding like Mephibosheth. You don't have to stay in your crippled state. You have the invitation to come to the king's table. You have the invitation to come to the throne, invitation to come back to the kingdom. I'm going to pray right now. And first of all, I want to lead you in a prayer of commitment. Maybe you need to surrender your life to Christ. If you have never done that before, why don't you pray this with me? With all of your heart, with your passion, with honesty, with humility, but also with faith. Pray with me. Father, I thank you for inviting me to the kingdom. I, I confess I'm a, I'm a sinner. And I ask you to cleanse me of my sin. I thank you for dying on the cross for my salvation, Jesus. I accept you into my heart. Please be my Savior. Be my Lord. I surrender my life to you. I surrender, I surrender my future to you. I give you my sins. I also give you my hopes. And I run to the table. Amen. Friends, there is no magic formula, but it begins with a simple invitation. And what follows is a daily change, a daily transformation. As you read the Bible as you pray with your own words, and as you grow in a Bible-believing church, 
your life is going to be transformed fully. And many of you, maybe Christians, you've been Christians for a long time, maybe all of your life, God wants to change your mindset, your mentality. Let me challenge you. God is the best plan for your life. Don't stay in hiding. Come to the throne. Come to the throne. You have full access to the kingdom, friends. Are you happy? Well, uh, in closing, I want to say if there is anything we can pray for you, if there is anything we can uh, uh, help you with spiritually, uh, please do not hesitate to write or to call. We are here for you. We love you. And we pray that um, you will uh, be equipped for this new dimension of life in the kingdom. We love you, friends, and we pray you have a wonderful time. Have a great week and see you next Sunday. Bless you.